lecture. So we've all heard about the, the challenges of uh, CO2 emissions. You know, I've talked about it in previous lectures, how we need to reduce them by cutting down on fossil fuel use. We need to increase energy efficiency, and also we need to adopt renewable energy sources. But what about the technologies that go a step further, directly removing the CO2 that's already being emitted into the atmosphere? So this lecture will explore these very technologies. So CO2 capture, storage, and reuse. We'll discuss how these methods are essential for advancing sustainability by not only mitigating emissions, but also managing and repurposing the carbon dioxide in innovative ways. So without further ado, let's begin. So this slide outlines the structure of our lecture, providing our own, a roadmap of what we'll cover. So we'll start with an introduction to the topic, setting the stage for why carbon capture, storage, and reuse are crucial for sustainability. Then we'll dive into the specifics of carbon capture and storage, or CCS in short, explore, exploring how we can capture CO2 and store it safely. Following that, we'll explore the innovative ways in which CO2 can be reused, turning a potential waste product into something valuable. We'll wrap up with a conclusion to summarize the key points, followed by a quick exercise to reinforce what we have learned, and then a Q&A session to address any questions that you might have. All right, so let's start with the introduction. So you probably have heard about the Sustainable Development Goals. These represent a global commitment to achieving a better and more sustainable future for all. They cover a wide range of critical areas, from eliminating poverty and hunger, to ensuring access to clean energy, and taking urgent action on climate change. So achieving these goals requires innovative solutions, especially in the realm of environmental protection and sustainable development. While much of the focus has been on reducing CO2 emissions through cleaner energy sources and improved efficiency, it's also essential to address the CO2 that's already in the atmosphere. So to do that, the Paris Agreement uh, adopted in 2015 by 196 countries marks a pivotal global commitment to addressing climate change. Its primary goal is to keep the global warming well below two, two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels with an even more ambiguous tar ambitious target of limiting it to 1.5 degrees Celsius. However, this agreement signifies a collective recognition of the need for urgent action to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, aiming to mitigate the worst impacts of climate change that unfortunately we now see. While much emphasis is placed on reducing emissions through cleaner energy and more efficient practices, the Paris Agreement also opens the door for innovative technologies like CO2 capture, storage, and reuse. So these technologies are crucial in managing the emissions that have already been released, offering a complementary strategy to emission reduction efforts. So let's take a look at uh, the current state on greenhouse gas emissions. So the concentration of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere has drastically increased from pre-industrial levels of about 280 ppm, which is parts per million, to over 410 ppm today. So this sharp rise is primarily due to the burning of fossil fuels, deforestation, and other human activities that release large amounts of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So this increase in greenhouse gas emissions, particularly CO2, is the primary driver of global warming and climate change. The graph here shown reflects the exponential growth in greenhouse gas emissions over the past century. This shows how human activities have significantly altered the composition of our, atm of our uh, atmosphere. If we look at it by sector, the CO2 emissions by sector reveal that the power generation sector is actually the largest contributor, followed by the industrial sector and the transportation sector. So these sectors are particularly challenging to decarbonize, especially in industries known as hard to abate industries. So these industries require high temperature heat which is typically generated by burning fossil fuels, which then makes reducing emissions difficult. Additionally, some CO2 emissions come directly from industrial processes, regardless of the energy source use, further complicating efforts to reduce the carbon footprint of these sectors. So as we said, the hard to abate sectors are industries where reducing CO2 emissions is particularly challenging due to the nature of their processes. So these include aluminum and seed production, paper manufacturing, chemicals, concrete, uh, and all of these uh, industries require high temperature heat and often emit CO2 directly during the production. Additionally, heavy transport sectors such as shipping also fall into this category due to their reliance on energy. 
uh, especially for the transportation of the ships. And there's a difficulty in adopting low carbon alternatives at a huger scale. So addressing the emissions in these sectors is actually crucial for achieving the global climate goals. So achieving net zero CO2 emissions is critical uh, to combat the climate change, as we said. And one of the most promising solutions for this is actually carbon capture, utilization, and storage. So CCUS, for short, is a technically, uh, technically mature technology that can effectively decarbonize power generation and energy intensive industrial sectors. So the ones that we were talking about recently. Actually, in fact, Dr. Uh, as emphasized by Dr. Birol, which is the executive director of the International Energy Agency, he said that integrating CCUS into our climate strategy is an indispensable for meeting the international climate targets. He said that without it, reaching our global climate goals would be nearly impossible. So this shows or emphasizes the importance of carbon capture and storage. With that, let's move on and talk about the actual technology and how it works. So this slide illustrates the process of carbon capture and storage, which involves four key steps to manage and permanently store CO2 emissions. The first step is capture. So CO2 is separated from other gases before it is emitted into the atmosphere. So this is typically done using a chemical solvent. The captured CO2 is then compressed into a liquid form to make it easier for transportation. The second step is transport, so the transportation. So the, li the liquefied CO2 is transported usually via pipelines from the industrial site where it was captured to a storage site. So these storage sites can be located either onshore or offshore, depending on the geological conditions. The next step is storage. So the CO2 is injected deep underground into porous rock formations, typically at depths of around 2,000 meters, so two, two, kilo two, two kilometers underground. So these rocks are covered by a layer of impermeable rock known as a cap rock, which ensures that the CO2 remains trapped underground permanently and not uh, come back to the atmosphere. The final step is measuring, monitoring, and verification. So there is continuous monitoring of the storage site because this is essential to ensure that the CO2 actually stays securely stored. So this involves uh, this involves using sensors to detect any changes in pressure or CO2 levels and employing various technologies to actually monitor the geological and environmental conditions surrounding the storage site. This slide shows how carbon capture technology can be actually integrated into a hydrogen production plant, just as an example. So the diagram illustrates two points where CO2 capture can occur during the production process of hydrogen. So, First is the pre-combustion carbon capture. So in this approach, CO2 is actually captured uh, before the fuel, so in this case, natural gas is combusted. The process starts with reforming, which is where natural gas reacts with steam to produce hydrogen and carbon monoxide, so the reforming process. Next, in the CO shift stage, which is uh, where the carbon monoxide reacts with steam to produce more hydrogen and carbon dioxide. Then the CO2 is then removed from the gas mixture before the hydrogen proceeds to the next stage, which is a pressure swing absorption stage, where pure hydrogen is obtained. This pre-combustion pre capture is part of the established production process. Then we also have a post-combustion carbon capture option. So this is an additional unit that can be integrated into the process. So this captures the CO2 from the flue gas, which is the gas emitted after the combustion process. The captured CO2 is then compressed for storage or utilization. So this step is crucial for capturing any remaining CO2 that wasn't captured during the pre-combustion stage. So the integration of these carbon capture methods in a hydrogen production plant is essential for reducing CO2 emissions, making the production of hydrogen cleaner and even more sustainable. Now let's look at another example. So this slide shows how carbon capture technology can be integrated into a natural gas combined cycle plant, focusing on a post-combustion approach using an amine removal unit. So the natural gas combined cycle process is uh, where natural gas is used as a primary fuel. So it is first compressed and then burned in a combustion chamber, generating flue gas. So this hot flue gas is then used to drive a gas turbine producing electricity. 
the waste heat from the gas turbine is captured and used to produce steam, which also drives a steam turbine, generating additional electricity. So this process enhances the overall efficiency. So where can the capture uh, be placed? Where after the flue gas is produced, it contains CO2 and other gases. So the post-combustion CO2 capture process is designed to remove this CO2 from the flue gas. The flue gas containing approximately 4% CO2 will be directed towards the amine removal unit. So what is the amine removal unit, you might wonder? Well, the amine removal unit is as shown on the screen. So this unit is a key technology for capturing CO2. It involves a chemical process where the flue gas is passed through an absorber containing an amine solvent. What happens is that the amine selectively absorbs the CO2 from the flue gas. So we'll basically use a chemical solvent to, to take the CO2 from our gas. Then the CO2 rich amine solution is then heated in a stripper column, which is uh, to reduce pure CO2, which can then be compressed for storage or utilization. Then we take the remaining amine solvent, which is now free of CO2, and recycle it back to the, uh, to the absorber for reuse. So we ensure that we have an, uh, a continuous loop, and in this way, we are not wasting any chemical solvent. Uh, this process, uh, this amine removal unit is actually a very established process uh, for natural gas treatment. So, and it's also used for other processes like uh, the dehydration of natural gas. So it can also, it can also be integrated now uh, for carbon capture. Now let's talk about CO2 geological storage. So this involves injecting the carbon dioxide deep underground into specific types of rock formations, which are capable of securely trapping the gas for extended periods. So here's how it works. The first step is the injection. So CO2 is injected deep into the Earth's subsurface using an injection pipe. This process places the CO2 into a porous rock formation typically sev several kilometers below the surface. Then the, these reservoirs uh, that are uh, used are considered ideal for CO2 storage because they have already trapped oil and gas for a million of years. So the same oil and gas reservoirs that we use to take and extract the oil and gas are the same ones that we put the CO2 back in because they have the same properties that allow them to actually hold these fossil fuels. So this makes them suitable for actually storing the CO2. As for the porous rock formations, the CO2 is injected into the porous rock layers where it can occupy the spaces between sand grains or other materials in the rock. Above this porous rock layer, a cap rock, which is an impermeable rock layer, acts as a seal. So this prevents the CO2 from actually migrating upwards and escaping back into the atmosphere. So another storage option is actually injecting the CO2 into underground saline aquifers. So these are porous rock formations filled with salty water, which is known as brine, which is not suitable for drinking or agri uh, agriculture. The CO2 can be safely stored in these formations, often in large quantities. So this method of storage, uh, storage is a critical component of the carbon capture and storage strategy, providing a way to mitigate the impact of CO2 emissions by securely locking the gas away underground, preventing it from contributing to the atmosphere greenhouse gas concentrations. So now let's talk about CO2 enhanced oil recovery, which is a method that involves injecting carbon dioxide into an oil reservoir to actually increase oil production. So how does that actually work? So first, injecting CO2 into the oil reservoir actually increases the overall pressure within the reservoir. This increased pressure pushes the oil towards the production wells, which makes the oil easier to extract. So CO2 can actually mix with the oil in the reservoir, reducing the oil's viscosity, which is the thickness of the oil, and making it more fluid. So this enhanced mobility actually allows the oil to flow more easily through the reservoir towards the production wells. So actually adding CO2 can help make our oil easier uh, to be transported. As a result of these processes, a significant amount of additional oil can be recovered from the reservoir. Currently, approximately 500,000 barrels of oil are produced daily through CO2 EOR techniques. So we can see that this is a very, very viable technique. So in this diagram, you can see the process visually. So the CO2 is injected through the injection well into the oil reservoir. Then the CO2 forms a miscible zone where it mixes with the oil, creating an oil bank that moves towards the production well. 
The oil is then extracted through the production well and transported to the market, while some of the CO2 can be recycled back to the system. So this method not only enhances the oil recovery, but also helps in sequ sequestering CO2 underground, which can contribute to reducing the overall CO2 emissions. So this slide highlights the, the global potential for geological storage of CO2. So the map shows areas around the world that are categorized by their suitability for CO2 storage. So the ones in red are highly suitable. So these areas have the best potential for actually storing CO2 due to their geological characteristics, like deep underground formations that can actually securely hold CO2. Then we have the ones in purple, which are suitable. These regions also have good potential, but may have sli slightly less ideal conditions compared to the highly suitable areas. Then we have areas in blue, which are possible areas. So in these areas, geological storage is possible, but may involve more challenges. So such as less favorable rock formations, or maybe perhaps depth issues. Then we have the light blue color, which is unlikely. So these regions are less likely to be viable for CO2 storage due to the unsuitable geological conditions. So the global CO2, the global CO2 uh, storage potential exceeds 13,000 gigatons, which could theoretically hold over 350 years of worldwide CO2 emissions at the 2021 emission rate. However, as of now, only 254 million tons of storage resources are considered commercial, commercially viable, indicating that while the potential is vast, the actual implementation on a commercial scale is unfortunately still limited. This slide provides an overall uh, an overview of global carbon capture and storage projects. Currently, there are 25 large-scale CCS facilities in operation worldwide. So these facilities are capable of capturing and storing approximately 40 million tons of CO2 annually. The map highlights the, ge the geographic distribution of these projects, showing that CCS technology is being implemented across various regions including North America, Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. Each marked location represents a significant CCS project, with some of the largest projects being located in the United States, Canada, Norway, and Australia. So these facilities play a crucial role in reducing CO2 emissions by capturing it from industrial processes or power generation and storing it underground, often in geological formation, such as depleted oil and gas fields, or saline aquifers. So some projects also utilize the CO2 for enhanced oil recovery, which, has, uh, which, would, which is what we have talked about recently, which helps to extract additional oil from existing fields. So this global network of CCS projects is essential in the broader strategy to mitigate climate change and achieve international climate goals, particularly in sectors that are difficult to decarbonize. So here we have some data on global capture and storage facilities and trends from 2022 to 2023. So it highlights actually the growing number of CCS projects worldwide and the increasing carb capture capacity over the years. On the left, the bar graph shows the total number of CCS facilities, which has increased from 194 in 2022 to 392 in 2023. So these facilities are categorized into different stages. So early development, advanced development, in construction, and operational. The significant rise in the number of facilities indicates a strong global commitment to actually expanding the CCS infrastructure. On the right, the bar graph shows the total CO2 carbon, uh, the CO2 carbon, uh, the CO2 capture capacity, which also saw an increase from 241 million ton per annum in 2022 to actually 361 million ton per annum in 2023. The bars illustrate the capture capacity by the development stage, showing a trend towards more advanced and operational projects. So these trends demonstrate a robust and accelerating global effort to actually implement CCS technologies as a critical part of strategies to reduce carbon emissions and address climate change. The percentage increase over the years underscored the actual the rapid expansion and the scaling of these CCS projects worldwide. Now let's talk about the infrastructures for CO2 management. 
So the diagram here actually explains the infrastructure needed for effective CO2 management and large scale carbon capture and storage projects. It shows how CO2 sources, which are the places where CO2 is emitted, like power plants or industrial sites, are connected to sinks, which are locations where CO2 can be, stored, uh, can be stored or utilized. So sinks in this context include sites like oil fields, where CO2 can be injected to enhance the oil recovery, or there could be depleted fields and other geological formations suitable for long-term CO2 storage. The diagram illustrates the network of transportation required to move CO2 from emission sources to these storage or utilization sites, enabling efficient and large scale CCS implementation. When multiple CO2 sources and SIGs are present, a hub is actually necessary to manage the collection, transmission and distribution of CO2 efficiently. Each hub operates with its own set of standards for CO2 purity, including criteria for acceptable impurities pressure, and temperature. Most of the existing CO2 management hubs are actually lo uh, located in the US, with several projects also active in Canada and Europe. So these hubs facilitate the coordination of CO2 from various industrial sources to appropriate storage or utilization sites, ensuring the effective implementation of carbon capture and storage strategies. Now let's talk uh, briefly about the European model for CCS. So the Northern, the Northern Lights project is actually a central element of Norway's comprehensive carbon capture and storage initiative known as Langskip, which is Longship. This project is fully supported by the Norwegian government and represents a significant advancement in CCS technology. The first phase of the Northern Lights is set to be completed by 2024 and aims to capture and store up to 1.5 million ton of CO2 per year. This CO2 that is captured onshore and then is transported by ships to an offshore location where it is injected and permanently stored deep beneath the North Sea bed at a depth of 2,600 meters. So this project is a leading example of European approach to large scale carbon management and storage solutions. All right. So let's talk about the factors impacting, uh, let's talk about the cost of carbon capture and storage, which is a very important issue. And what are the factors that actually impact the cost? So the first factor is actually the CO2 partial pressure. So the higher the, the, higher the concentration of CO2 in the, in the exhaust gases, the easier and cheaper it is to capture. This factor affects the size and size of the energy requirements of the carbon capture equipment as well as the choice of technology used. The next one is the economies of scale. So as with many industrial processes, increasing the scale of operations tends to reduce the unit cost. So larger facilities can actually produce more CO2 for capture, spreading fixed costs over a large volume of captured CO2. Then the technology, the technology maturity. So the stage of the development of the CCS technology also plays a cru crucial role. More mature technologies are typically more cost-effective due to the improved efficiency and lower operational risks. Finally, we have the facility integration. So the extent to which the CCS systems can be integrated into existing industrial infrastructure actually impacts the cost significantly. Well integrated systems require less additional infrastructure and modifications, reducing the overall expenses. So these factors collectively determine the economic feasibility of CCS projects. But how about the, the CCS support initiatives? Well, actually there are several initiatives in place to support the development and implementation of carbon capture and storage technologies. First one is carbon tax. So this is a tax actually imposed on the carbon content of fossil fuels. By increasing the cost of emitting greenhouse, gas, greenhouse gases, a carbon tax incentivizes this company to actually reduce their carbon emissions making CCS technologies more economically attractive. This means that if a company or an industry releases more CO2, they have to pay for that. So this tax helps, for, uh, helps to make carbon capture uh, and storage technologies uh, look lucrative. Then we have the emission trading system or ETS for short. So this is a market-based approach where emission units or allowances can be traded between emitters. So companies that reduce their emissions can actually sell their excess allowances to others that exceed their emission target. So this system creates a financial incentive for emission reductions, 
including the use of CCS. Then we have commitment and regula uh, regulations. So governments and international bodies commit to emission reduction targets, often accompanied by regulations that require or encourage the adoption of CCS technologies. So these commitments help to create a stable policy environment that actually supports the investment in CCS. Lastly, we have funding mechanisms. So these include grants, subsidies, and public funding directly toward the development and construction of CCS projects. So financial support reduces the economic burden on companies adopting CCS and actually accelerates the, de the deployment of these technologies. So the first two uh, support initiatives are actually called carbon pricing. All right, in this section, we'll talk about CO2 reuse. So after we've talked about the capture of CO2, but, and we say that we can store it. Another option is to actually to use the CO2 to produce uh, products that we that we that are useful in our day-to-day -day use. So let's talk about the product categories for CO2 conversion. So CO2 can be converted into a variety of valuable products across different categories. The first one is concrete and carbonate materials. So CO2 can actually be used as a feedstock in concrete production, acting as a new or alternative material in the curing process. It can also react with various minerals to form carbonates which are typically used in building materials. So the CO2 that we captured, we can actually use to help us in construction. The second option is to use it for fuels and chemicals. So with the addition of energy, CO2 can actually be, be converted into various carbon-based fuels like methanol or synthetic hydrocarbons, as well as a wide range of organic chemicals such as ethylene and carbamates. So these can be used directly as fuels or as feedstocks in the production of other materials, like plastics, for example. Then we can use it also for polymers and bioplastics, which we talked about uh, in our previous lecture. So CO2 can be actually utilized in the polymerization reaction, either through biological systems or as a co-monomer. So this will help to produce polymers and bioplastics. So this actually contributes in creating sustainable materials with reduced reliance on fossil fuels. So not only are we capturing the CO2, but we're actually using it to produce something sustainable. So we're kind of hitting two birds with one stone through this approach. Oh, sorry. All right, uh, we've talked about, so we've talked about fuels and chemicals and polymers of plastic. So the last option is to use it for durable carbon materials. So CO2 can be transformed into valuable carbon nanomaterials, such as carbon, nan uh, carbon nanofibers and carbon nanotubes. So these materials have a wide range of applications due to their strength, durability, and versatility. So we see that these categories represent diverse ways in which CO2 can be repurposed, offering both environmental and economic benefits by turning a greenhouse gas into useful products. So this table provides an overview of the maturity and potential of various markets for CO2 conversion across different commercial categories. So for the concrete and carbonate, uh, material, carbonate materials, the market potential is actually large, indicating a significant opportunity in this sector. As for the product market value, it's actually low, which means that the products are not highly valued in the market. For the deployment of the utilization technologies, it's ready in the near term, so around five to 10 years with existing te technologies and market conditions supporting their growth. As for the energy input, it's low as the thermodynamics are favorable, requiring minimal energy for production. For the carbon reduction, uh, carbon retention, sorry, th there is permanent retention, ensuring that the CO2 remains sequestered long-term. As for uh, the fuels and chemicals, the market potential we see is also large and the product market value is quite high. As for the technologies, it's near to medium term, so five to 20 years, which are through which technologies are fairly mature in some cases. As for the energy input, substantial energy is actually required, which may impact the overall feasibility. And for the carbon retention, it is actually temporary, which is typically less than one year for fuels and up to 10 years for some chemical intermediates. For the polymers and bioplastics, the market potential is modest and the product market value is actually quite high. For the technologies, it's similar to the fuel and chemicals, so it's near to medium term, but for the energy input, it's actually low, making the production energy inefficient, energy efficient. For the carbon retention, it's long-term retention, potentially even hundreds of years. And lastly, for the durable carbon materials, the market potential is very large in the future perspective with significant potential for growth. 
The product value ranges from moderate to very high, depending on a specific product. And the utilization technologies uh, will be long term, with technologies still very early in the in the early stages of development. And for the energy input, uh, there's also a high amount of energy required, which could be a limiting factor. And lastly, for the carbon retention, this is actually permanent retention, ensuring that CO2 is stored for the long term. So I just wanted to, to give you a quick uh, overview of all these markets. So let's talk about CO2 reuse via photosynthesis. So I'm sure you might have heard of photosynthesis. So photosynthesis orga organisms such as cyanobacteria and microalgae play a crucial role in converting CO2 into useful biomass. They efficiently use light energy, whether from the sun or artificial sources, to transform water and CO2 into various organic compounds. So microalgae are particularly effective at producing lipids, <clears throat> which can be used to create biodiesel. So this makes them a valuable resource for biofuel production. In contrast, plants and microalgae pri primarily produce carbohydrates, uh, car carbohydrates, which are essential for the production of bioethanol that we talked about previously. Additionally, the proteins produced by these organisms can be used as a food source, contributing to food security. So the, the process is as follows. So how can we actually produce uh, food? So what we do is provide sunlight and CO2 to these uh, organisms. And through that, they produce lipids, carbohydrates, proteins, and oxygen. So the lipids, what can we use it for? Well, we can use the lipids to produce biodiesel. We can use the carbohydrates to actually produce bioethanol. And the proteins that we get, we can actually use for food production. So we can see we have multiple uses uh, from this reaction or from this process. So let's talk about the pros and cons of this, of this process. The first pro is that there is high efficiency. So the conversion of solar energy into oils by photosynthetic, or, uh, photosynthetic organisms like microalgae is 10 to 20 times more efficient than that of conventional land crops. So this means that these organisms utilize space much more efficiently. Another pro is the CO2 utilization. So for every kilogram of biomass produced, nearly two kilograms of CO2 are consumed, making it a very effective method for actually reducing the CO2 consumed. The, then the cyanobacteria can actually be generally engineered to produce several products. So we can actually uh, design or help the, or we can actually you know, decide what our final product will be, whether it's lactic acid, ethylene, and so on. However, with every process, there are also some cons. So the first con is that the biomass yield strongly depends on the operating conditions. And it can also, and the biomass must also be extracted to produce fuels or chemicals. So we, talk, we talked about it in the previous lecture where it's not very straightforward to make this biodiesel or bioethanol on a larger scale. So we, there are still uh, some technological uh, limitations. So they're still being developed as traditional open point cultivation techniques are still not suitable for efficient and reliable production. So this diagram uh, shows the, use, the reuse of CO2 in carbonate materials, which involves a reaction where CO2 is combined with metal oxide, such as calcium or magnesium oxide to form stable metal carbonates. So this process can occur both within the ground, which is in C2, and ex C2, which is outside the, original, outside the original location. So the CO2 reacts with metal oxides like calcium or magnesium oxide to form metal carbonates, which are solid, thermodynamically stable, and non-toxic. This reaction is exothermic, meaning it releases heat. The CO2 is permanently fixed in solid form, making it an effective method for long-term carbon storage. The reaction is spontaneous, but can be very slow under normal conditions. So the process can be accelerated by increasing the surface area of the reactants, uh, example, through grinding and raising the temperature and pressure or adding acids. So the carbon dioxide can actually be reused by converting it into carbonate materials. So particularly using calcium and magnesium oxide. These materials can be utilized in various industries, especially in construction for short-term and long-term CO2 storage reduce, uh, in short-term and long-term CO2 storage solutions. So here in the diagram, there's some uh, information about the market potential, the performance evaluation, and also some of the areas of improvement. Now let's talk about another way, which is using CO2 to chemicals. 
So to convert CO2 into valuable chemicals, the process can be broken down into two main steps. The first step is to identify valuable products. So we need to ensure which products that are valuable to produce. And the second step is to assess the conversion process. So once the valuable products are identified, we need to evaluate the process required to convert the CO2 into these products. This includes understanding the technology, the energy requirements, and the efficiency of different conversion methods. This assessment also considers the scalability of these processes and how they can be integrated into our current industrial systems. So we said the first step is to identify viable products. This could include uh, urea, which is for fertilizers and resins, or salicylic acid, which is used in aspirin and medicines, or we can for, use it to produce formic acid and formates, or we can use it to produce methanol, acetic acid, ethylene, propylene, MTB, which all come uh, as a product from methanol. And then we can also produce uh, inorganic carbonate. So there's a lot of uh, valuable materials that can be actually considered to produce, uh, to use the CO2 uh, to convert it to chemicals. As for the next step, we need to assess the different processes that can be used to convert the CO2 into valuable products. So these include uh, processes like electrochemical, con uh, electrochemical conversion, photochemical conversion, biochemical uh, conversion, or even thermocatalytic conversion. So just to explain them in short, uh, for electrochemical conversion, this is where CO2 electrolysis uh, is happening, which is an emerging research area focusing on converting CO2 into useful chemicals and fuels. However, further research is required to improve this technology's maturity, particularly in terms of the efficiency, selectivity, and yield. Then we have the photochemical conversion, where this uses uh, light energy to promote the reaction between CO2 and water to generate hydrocarbons. So it's a promising method as it, it mimics the way plants naturally convert CO2. Then we have biochemical conversion, which is uh, through biochemical reactions involving enzymes or bacteria. So an example of this is the ethanol fermentation process in the cyanobacteria, where CO2 is actually used as a feedstock to produce ethanol, or bioethanol in this case. Then as for the thermocatalytic conversion, this is the, 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 the traditional way, it's like the production of hydrogen uh, plays a critical role. So in the, in the reverse water gas shift reaction, which is the thermocatalytic route for converting CO2 into chemicals. So basically, when you hear the word catalytic conversion, it means that a catalyst, is, uh, a catalyst is being used for the process. So in the process of freezing CO2 to create fuels, this pathway involves combining CO2 with green hydrogen through various catalytic process. So here's how it works step by step, so from top to bottom. So the first step, we have the catalytic methanation. In this process, the CO2 is reacted with green hydrogen to produce methane or liquefied natural gas, or LNG in short. This method effectively transforms the CO2 into a valuable fuel that can be used in various energy applications. Then the next step is the reverse water gas shift plus fissure trap, where the, re the reverse water gas shift reaction first converts the CO2 into carbon monoxide by reacting it with hydrogen. The resulting syn gas, which is a mixture of CO2 and hydrogen, is then processed through the fissure trap synthesis process to produce synthetic fuels like naphtha, sustainable aviation, or diesel. So we said the first step produces methane or LNG, the second step produces C syn gas, and then naphtha, SAF, and diesel. And the last step, CO2 and green hydrogen are categorically converted into methanol, which can be then processed further into hydrocarbons such as sustainable aviation fuel or gasoline. So these processes show how the conversion of CO2 can be done into different types of synthetic fuels, actually contributing to a circular carbon economy where CO2 is reused rather than being released into the atmosphere. So what are the, some of the growth factors and challenges related to these technologies? Well, the growth factor is that there's a increasing demand for decarbonization, decarbonization in the transport sector. So this makes it very attractive. There's an increasing cost of fossil fuels as well, and also the evolution of production technology. So we can see that our production technology is being uh, much more better. So this is an attractive option for, to implement CCS. As for the challenges, high production costs, unfortunately, uh, there is still a lack of distribution infrastructure, and there's also competition with fossil fuels. So global e-fuels production will increase from 50 million tons in 2024 to actually 100 million tons in 2030. And then we have also another approach with the CO2 reuse to polymers and bioplastics. 
So we can see from this diagram, the world, the world plastic production and carbon feedstock in 2018 and the scenario for 2050 in million tons. So we can see the diversion plastic production of 364 megaton in 2018, which is almost 99% fossil based, will increase to 450 megaton in 2050, completely based on renewable carbon. So the greatest barrier to industrial CO2 utilization is actually the stability and relative, uh, relative inertness of the molecule. So we have to look at the technological pathways. So either chemocatalytic can be used or biochemical to convert it to polymers and bioplastics. As for CO2 reuse to durable carbon materials, so pure carbon can exist in many different forms. Uh, the chemical and physical properties of those materials are determined by the structural geometry of the atoms and the type of chemical bonds within the molecules. So some of the most well-known carbon allotropes are um, diamond and graphite, graphene, uh, nanotubes, uh, carbon nanofibers, and carbon, and carbon filters, and carbon fibers, sorry. Let's talk about the growth fat and challenges for this area. So the plastics and composites could dominate the market due to the growing use of engineered polymers in the automotive and the construction industries. The electrical and electronic sectors may experience significant growth in plastic applications. As for the challenges, there is a high production cost of carbon nanotubes, which is a significant barrier to the industrial use. And the environmental regulations and health concerns related to prolonged exposure also limit the market value of CNTs which are classified as chemical substances under the Toxic Substance, Substances Control Act. With that, I move on to the conclusion of our talk, and let's see what we have learned so far. So to conclude, carbon capture, storage, and reuse is essential in addressing climate change, as it reduces carbon emissions from industrial sources, lowering the carbon footprint. Reusing CO2 captured, uh, captured CO2 is crucial, with ongoing efforts to develop diverse and effective pathways for the utilization. Challenges include cost, technology development, and public acceptances. Ongoing advancements and global commitment highlights the potential of CCSR. Integrating CCR into the climate change strategies supports environmental protection and also fosters the sustainable economic growth. With that, I move on to our quick exercise uh, before we proceed to the Q&A section. So, uh, the first question of today's exercise is, what is the primary goal of carbon capture, storage, and reuse? So feel free to add the answers in, in the chat. OK, put your answers into chat. I see Bibi Faziana already has her answer in there. So the answer is, um, hold on, okay. So the answer is actually reduce CO2 emissions from industrial sectors. So the whole point of CCS is actually to reduce the CO2 emissions from the hard to abate sectors such as the industrial sources. Second question is, which of the following is a common use for captured CO2? So do we use it to burn as a fuel or do we dispose it in the ocean or do we use it for enhancing oil recovery or do we use it for creating fertilizers directly? Okay, so we have C's, uh, we have a D. So the answer is actually C, but the D is actually uh, another option, but more commonly it's used for enhancing oil recovery. So you can actually use CO2 to produce uh, urea, as we say, which can be used for fertilizers, but it uh, is not as common as using it for enhancing oil recovery. Third question is, what is a key benefit of using CO2 in enhanced oil recovery? So A, it enhances the oil extraction efficiency, B, it helps in reducing water storage. C, it increases the viscosity of the oil. Or D, it decreases the pressure in the reservoir. We have an A, we have a D. So 
So we can see that the answer is actually split between D and A. All right. Okay, so the answer is actually uh, the answer is actually A. So it enhances oil extraction efficiency. So using CO two enhanced oil recovery actually increases the pressure in the reservoir, not decreases it. And by increasing the pressure, this actually helps in the oil extraction efficiency. We move on to the next question: Is uh, which country currently has the most operational CO two for enhanced oil recovery? So I've said this during the talk. Let's see. If uh, maybe you've caught into it, so is it Canada, or is it the U.S. So the United States of America, or is it China, or D Germany? Okay, the answer is actually B. So it's the US. They currently have the most operation CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. We move on to the final question, which is, which of the following factors impact the cost of carbon capture, storage, and reuse? So is it the CO2 partial pressure? Is it B, economies of scale? Is it C, technological maturity? Or is it D, all of the above? So we have some Ds and we have some Cs, all right. So the answer is actually D. So all of these factors actually contribute and impact the cost of CO2 capture, storage, and reduced technologies. So with that, I come to the end of this talk and I'll open the session for Q&A. So feel free to ask any questions that you might have. Thank you.